Sure, it's a pleasure to be all here. This is a video that I shared with Hans Benson here this year. I think I spoke for us both when I see that it's both nice to work for as a member of the European community to make this happen and also to have it happen here in Gothenburg because it's his hometown and for me it's also like a home away from home. So it's a double pleasure. And um, I <coughs> won't get you waiting any longer. We have a this very distinguished uh, invited student speaker here, and it's really hard to introduce. It's really hard to introduce to me, but you probably know uh, how prominent the research he is and how prolific author he is. And he's a member, a senior member of ACM, and it's in the steering committee of IFL uh, and CSP, and well, he's done so much that I will let him <laughs> speak uh, uh, about. Uh, Probably the recent work that they've been doing in connection with Erdogan uh, in the Paraphrase project, the uh, European project that has a number of uh, people from the community involved in the University of Toronto as, as the leader of the project. So, just welcome to you and welcome <coughs> to and to the Okay, thank you very much, Lara. Uh, good morning, is the common in Sverige. Did I get that right? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's very appropriate uh, to uh, speak here in Sweden about Erlang and Paul, so I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, very, very proud to be able to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, normally when I introduce myself these days, I say, I wrote the first classical compiler, and uh, people then often recognise what I've done. 20 years ago I used to say that and nobody knew what I, what I was talking about. <laughs> so I'm pleased to say there's been a huge amount of progress in functional programming. So why don't you check out our, some results that we've been uh, working on in the Paraphrase project uh, over the uh, last uh, three years. I'm going to keep this fairly general, and I'm going to try to make this interactive. So please guys, ask me questions uh, during the talk. Uh, if you don't ask me questions, I, what I say is that I will ask you questions. And I know a bit more about the topic than you do. <coughs> so your questions are going to be easier, trust me. Certainly for you. So, I'm talking about functional programming in the megacore uh, era. Now, today, multi-core is ubiquitous. Um, even the little laptop that I've got sitting on the desk here uh, is a multi-core machine. It's a MacBook Air. It's about uh, two years old in the design. How, how many cores does my laptop have? First question for the audience. Are you awake? <laughs> how many cores? Two. Yes. Two. Eight. Four. Oh, eight. No, no, seven. <laughs> seven. <laughs> seven. <laughs> seven. One hundred twenty-eight. Hasn't count. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. A scientist. One hundred twenty-eight. One hundred twenty-eight. Very good. Two fifty-six. Should we take a photo on this? Who thinks it's one? Two. Four. Six. Eight. Ten. Twelve. 16, 128. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than it might seem. So this, by the way, is a dual core uh, x86. It's a, it's a low powered device. This is not a top end machine. This is a little lightweight laptop that I'm supposed to be carrying around with me on the road. I, I don't need that much power just to run PowerPoint. Well, maybe I do. <laughs> so we have two x86 ports. Well, or maybe there are really four when you start to dig into the detail, because Intel has this thing called hyperthreading. Uh, so we're able to take advantage of some spare uh, execution units. Maybe we've got really four cores rather than two cores. Oh, then we have 12 GPU execution units, which most people probably forgot about. And these are, these are really cores too. So there are another 12 cores, a bit specialist. Uh, there are two high-definition video encoders, decoders. Almost nobody knows about these, but they're sitting in there. Uh, there's a Bluetooth controller. That's a little core. It's, it's not an x86 core, but I bet that ARM make it. Very good guess that ARM make it. There's a little processor sitting inside that. There's a disk controller. That happens to be a processor. That happens to be a core. There's a power management unit. We've got a little processor, which is basically more powerful than the first <coughs> computer sitting around in this device, and its only job is to check on the energy usage of my laptop and turn it on and off when it needs to. That's pretty amazing. And you get more and more and more. So overall, we've got something like, you can add it up, 
4, 16, 18, 20, about 20 or 30 cores in this little commodity device, which is, which is sitting on, on the desk here. And that's just an example of what's happening in the world, uh, happening today. Now, we tend to ignore everything apart from CPU cores here. But that's a mistake. In the future, what we're going to see is devices getting more and more cores, more and more specialist types. And we are going to want to be able to take advantage of that. And that's one of the messages that I'm going to try to present to you today. In the world today, it's mainly about CPUs and about GPUs, but in the future, we're going to be concerned about all different types of specialist device. How do we take the best advantage of each of these devices? So today, um, so this is the multi-core uh, in my laptop. If you go out into the shops today, you can buy one of these devices. This was released in 2013 uh, at some point. This is Intel Xeon Phi uh, 720p. <coughs> it has 60 x86 cores running in a single chip package. That's pretty impressive. I'm not going to put one in my laptop. 300 watts is going to be a little hot for me to use. So there are trade-offs happening here, but this is the future. What we have today, multi-core, what we have uh, in high-end systems, really high-end systems, uh, many-core. Where's this leading us? Well, it's leading us to a future where we will have hundreds of thousands or millions of cores uh, available to us um, in a single uh, device. Maybe not all the same type of core, but I confidently predict that we will have this kind of number of cores available. And I call this the mega-core computer. Now, John and Mary have heard this before. If you haven't heard this term before, please get hot onto Wikipedia, start editing the web page. I want to be credited for the term, please. <laughs> what are these devices going to look like? Well, they're probably not just going to be scaled versions of today's multi-core. We might have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands <coughs> of dedicated lightweight integer units, each, each of them like a CPU today, maybe even smaller, more like ARM, I think, than like x86. Hundreds of floating point units uh, to uh, GPUs, auto act as floating point processes for specific applications, um, high performance type calculations. A few of these heavyweight uh, general purpose cores, x86 type things, to do the heavy lifting where you simply can't break things down into efficient uh, parallel computations and you need some big, heavy sequential computations. But these are going to become rarer, I think. I think what we will see is more things like ARM cores, fewer things like x86 cores. So we're in a transitionary period where x86 is just holding out, but it looks as like if it's not going to happen too much longer. There is going to be some sort of step change, and what's probably going to happen is the switch to a few of these really big, beefy uh, x86 cores and a lot a uh, swarm of little lightweight uh, integer units that we have to bring. Yeah. So does ARM take over the, the entire world, or does Intel join the, the ARM-style design <laughs> philosophy? Or yes, both? definitely. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> so the, the, answer, the answer actually is probably both. ARM is already taking over the world. Intel is very worried about it. Intel is trying to shift to something like the ARM model, <coughs> but it hasn't succeeded so far. So it's aware of the danger, it knows what's happening. Uh, they, they know the future is in, is in this direction of smaller, uh, energy efficient devices, uh, but they haven't managed to make transition. And there's a lot of drag through things like desktops, etc. A lot of drag through applications running x86 code. So this is the problem is how do we manage the smooth transition? The tablets are a huge background. War at the moment is not over desktop computers, it's over tablet and phone computers. And there you can say with some confidence that ARM is winning. And another low power device manufacturer, they're winning. Okay, almost every device you look at has an ARM core in it somewhere. They can probably tell us all about that. You're also going to see uh, some specialist units uh, doing things like graphics. Uh, authentication, networking, etc. So we're going to have so many cores sitting around that we can just dedicate them to do silly little things that we don't want the main uh, process to do. You know, unimportant things like the internet. 
you can get a processor to deal with that. Uh, possibly, and this is very exciting for me as a compiler writer, soft cores, field programmable gate arrays, ones where we don't have to put up with this idiotic instruction set we've had since the 1970s, uh, which has evolved into the x86, but where we can say, well, actually, the instructions I need to write to run my functional program are the following. I'll, I'll have the reduce machine instruction, please, and, and I'll have the map machine instruction, and I'll have a few others. Wouldn't that be fantastic? I can just program these in my silicon using uh, FPGAs, well that's today's technology, hopefully something a little easier to use in the future. But most importantly, this is going to be highly heterogeneous. We're not just going to have a single type of device, we're going to have a lot of different type of devices in such a system. And we're going to have to figure out how to deal with all of these different devices within the same framework. Isn't that exciting? Good. Isn't it frightening? Yes. yes. Good. <laughs> it's frightening if you live in a boring old world where all software is the same, uh, but you only have one chipset to deal with. Um, of course, to language designers, uh, to implementers, this is really, really exciting. We've got a huge range of possibilities opening up to us. We just have to figure out how do we take advantage of this. This is going to be fun. Um, the assumption that we've had for the last 30, 40 years or so, which we have is that we have one humongous lump of memory that we can just address uh, in the same cost whenever we like, is simply going to go away. As you move to these really large scale systems, and we're already seeing this <coughs> in modern high performance computing systems, you can't simply go to a memory location, look up the value, write it within a single clock cycle. That just doesn't happen. You need to take account of where the memory is located. Not all memory is going to be equal. And it's not going to be possible to simply allocate one great array and to address every part of that array uh, equally well. So all the abstractions that are based around array processing, they're just going to become untenable in time. They're not going to work, basically. And that is very frightening if you're a C programmer. Uh, as a functional programmer, well, hey, this is Cool, right? I just move my data around the machine to the place where it needs to be. All I have to do is solve that little mapping problem and everything will be great. So we have the right abstractions, but we don't have the right implementations yet. And there's a challenge for us to work on. So shared memory is not going to be a good abstraction. Can you say a bit more about how a functional model helps you to deal with um, an hierarchical memory? Okay. Well, let's take a tree as an example, shall we? So a tree uh, is accessed from the root, it's decomposed into subtrees. I can allocate one of the subtrees in one part of the machine and another in another. Very simple example, just from a straight point. So, so the point is that I don't, have, uh, I don't have an idea of contiguous address space. I don't uh, have to start at one location, step through the memory in some particular order to access all the elements in the data structure. So functional data structures uh, are, and uh, data structures in general, are a much better fit to this kind of machine than the uh, typical kind of array processing you see in imperative programs. And of course, object-oriented programs share some of these characteristics with functional ones too. Provided not do too much array processing. Or indeed any language with data structures. Any language with decent data structures, yes. yes. Some people think. That, uh, some very, very, that arrays our data structures. So, non-uniform shared memory. So we're probably getting to a system where we don't have uniform shared memory. These are so-called NUMA uh, architectures, non-uniform memory architectures. These are going to become the norm. They're not going to be the exception as they are at the moment. Uh, this is going to be mainstream. And we're already seeing that. Uh, devices like uh, AMD's Optron series actually don't have shared memory. They provide the illusion of shared memory by setting up messages between different chips at a hardware level. Okay. So they're trying to maintain the illusion of shared memory, but the reality, trust me, is not. And if you poke hard enough, you can actually see this. Uh, if you look at Intel's latest 
uh, Czech designs that has well designed, uh, they don't, they, they're moving even away, if you like, from the idea of accessing uh, memory locations, reading from memory locations. What they have is an idea of transactions, hardware transactional memory, like software transactional memory that we're used to in the, uh, in the Haskell community, uh, where you simply set up a series of alterations to your memory and commit it as a single unit, as a single transaction. And if you have a system where you don't actually have local memory, sorry, where you don't have a single memory space, this is possibly a more sensible way to do things. You just make all of the operations in one go. And these things are going to become very, very common. Just the stage where we can ignore that problem, but it's not going to be many years before, before uh, you get your C program coming up to you and saying, hey, I just tried to commit this transaction to my hardware, and it failed. I don't quite know why. Please, please, please help me. You can say, well, the answer is functional program. Of course. So let me tell you about the fastest computer in the world today. This is, I hope it's still the fastest. These things change on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, does anyone know where this is? China. China. OK, good guess. <laughs> it's the Tian2 at the Chinese National uh, University of Defense Technology. It has 33.86 uh, pet flops. This is how they measure these things, as of my birthday last year. Uh, it has 16,000 nodes. Each of them has two Ivy Bridge multi-cores. These, these are something like six or eight core processors. Uh, and three of those Xeon Phi's that I showed you at the start of the talk. That's a lot of power. Altogether, <coughs> it has 3,120,000 uh, x86 cores. That, that is a heck of a lot. So mega core is not just the future, it's actually the present. People are actually making these things. Okay, they're building these, not in very large numbers, but they are being built, it is possible to build them. I wonder what they're using this thing for. Chinese National University of Defense Technology. <laughs> That's a long form of NSA. <laughs> That's right. My, my talk, if anyone out there is listening to my talk in China, <laughs> <laughs> Please let me know. We, within the project we're running, within the Paraphrase project, we have access to a machine that's not quite that scale, um, but it does have 38 racks of 96 nodes, uh, each with 3,552 compute nodes. Each of them has two sockets, <coughs> uh, which are uh, populated with 16 core AMD chips, 113,000 cores. Okay. So there's a machine in Europe, in Germany, uh, that we have uh, access to. It's not too shabby. We're hoping to run some Erlang code on that later on this year. I'll tell you about the results. So, really, really exciting. It's not, of course, just about large systems. You know, e even my mobile phone is multi-core. Uh, the Samsung uh, Exynos uh, 5 Octa uh, phone has eight cores. Uh, only four of which you can use at any time. One? No, the cooling off. Sorry? The others are cooling off. The others are cooling off. It's not, that's a good answer. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah. I thought you were going to say it's marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so the Exynos 5, it has eight cores. Uh, four of them are turned off because they have two kinds of core. They have fast cores, which are very hot, and slow cores, which are much cooler, which are much lower energy usage. And basically, you can switch between the two sets of uh, core at any time. So you can either have the fast ones running, uh, burn through your battery very, very quickly, uh, doing uh, important, uh, running important applications uh, like games. Games, yes. <laughs> or you can uh, use the slower, energy efficient processes running less important applications like you know, email and web and word processing, that kind of stuff. Okay? So you have a choice. Seriously, I think this is how people think. Games are driving this to some extent. But these performance energy trade-offs that we've been hinting at mean that systems are going to become increasingly parallel. So the more parallel there is, the better you can manage your energy budget. Even embedded systems are becoming multi-core and heterogeneous. I'll show you one of those in a second. 
if we don't solve the multiple challenge, then basically we're not going to make any progress in any other area of computer science. So this is a fundamental challenge to our computer science is dealing with this kind of system. Because these are not exotic, uh, weird beasts as we're used to thinking the last 20 or 30 years. These are current and future mainstream processes of times. If you don't deal with this, then you're going to be mired in the past, left behind. Absolutely fundamental. All future programming will be parallel. This thing is kind of fun. This is uh, NVIDIA Tegra uh, TK1. I just uh, bought one of these. Uh, it's basically an embedded supercomputer. So it has four fast ARM um, uh, Cortex A15 cores, one slower uh, A, also an A15 core. Uh, so this is a low power core, so you have four fast ones, one slow one. Same idea as with Samsung, you can switch between them. This one only has one slow one. It has a 192 core GPU, not too bad for an embedded system. Uh, video encoders, decoders, as on my laptop, and shared memory. In this case, it's shared between the <coughs> CPU and the CPU. And that is quite an advance uh, in these things. It's very exciting for people who play with these things. Because what it means is you don't have to do this horrible CPU, GPU dance that we do at the moment, where I've got the data. No, you've got the data. No, I've got the data. No, you've got the data. If you repeat this over the course of an execution, you spend most of your time shuffling data between the CPU and the GPU. And that's a terrible thing to do within an integrated system. Okay, so what, I'm, what we're thinking is this kind of thing is going to be a building block for a mega core or similar type of device. Within the device, shared memory is probably the best way to work. But across the system, it doesn't. This thing down here is kind of important. One to five watts of peak power usage. So if they've got a device here uh, which is well, probably rather more powerful than my laptop, um, they're intending to put this into things like uh, tablet computers, etc. It's only going to use one to five watts of power at its peak. So they say. That's pretty impressive. That's a lot of computational power for the energy usage. So watch out for this. But say that I've got one of these mega four machines built up from Tegra's or from whatever, doesn't that mean that I'm going to have to have millions of threads uh, to be able to uh, to be able to deal with the millions of ports? Well, <coughs> do yes, as one of my colleagues says. Of course, you're going to have to have millions of threads. The only problem is how do you get them? Here's the profile that I created uh, earlier, about a year or two back. Uh, this is in Haskell. Uh, LM people, don't feel too jealous. We're working towards it. But this is some stuff I've been doing for a, a few years. If you look down here, what you'll see is our total number of threads created. Now, what we can see is, I'll reach out, 331-161-522. It's not my mobile phone number. <laughs> this is 331 million threads that this little program has created. We created them in 4.5 or 5 seconds of execution. That's, uh, what, 10 million threads per second that have been created. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? This is, by the way, just a little test bed, a stress test. Now, say that I run this on my current <coughs> systems, well, it's not really going to work, is it? We're going to get something like frozen job. The trick is this little number down here, which is, of the work that I created, this is how much that I've actually used. This is running on a conventional machine today. It's actually only got eight cores. I've created potentially 331 million threads of execution. What I've done is to choose from those 331 million, 20,000 that are actually going to make the system work well. So automatically using uh, very sophisticated 
runtime mechanisms that we've developed in, in Haskell over 20 or years or so, uh, we've been able to pick the ones that actually make the difference and allow us to get good and efficient execution. You can see all of the calls are basically um, busy for the uh, duration. So it is possible to do this. And that, I think, is one of the tricks. If we want to scale up to make a call, we have to have the potential to have millions of threads. But we want to be able to scale from machines that we have in the desktop, uh, in laptops, in tablets, all the way up to these really large machines. And that means that we have to have this kind of scale scalability and flexibility in our systems. And of course, Erlang does have scalability, but it's a different kind of scalability. We'll be hearing about that later on uh, in the workshop. So I'm going to give you one of my favorite sections of sets of slides. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, and what I'm going to do is to tell you how to build a wall, with apologies to Ian Watson from Manchester University. So the story is that I went to Manchester one time a few years back, I gave a talk like this, and Ian said, well, Ke well Kevin, in the question session, it's all very well, uh, you're creating these millions of threads, but not everything is parallelizable. I said, okay, well, I like a challenge. Like what? And he said, like building a wall. If you're building a wall, you place a brick, and then you place another brick, and so on, and now I've got a layer of bricks, and then I place a second row of bricks, and I've got the second level of bricks, and now I place the third row of bricks, and now I've got my wall. And that has to be sequential. Okay, so, so I, I like the challenge. So I went away and I thought about it a bit. I thought, well, say that you've got four uh, brick, brick layers. Uh, let's say they're efficient Swedish bricklayers as opposed to the type that I get in Britain. <laughs> uh, I sorry, told please edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> How can I build a wall faster? <coughs> well, we can lay some bricks at the same time. Yeah? So I, I like to think in parallel. Then we can lay some more bricks. Now I've got our first level of uh, wall. Now we can do the same. And we can lay them again. And we can do the third. And so on. And now we've got a wall. Okay? And we've got it in parallel. As opposed to suspension. So I think I've won. <laughs> how much faster is that than doing it with one brick layer? Depends on how much they have to communicate with us. Ah, okay. So let's, say, let's assume that these are perfectly efficient, 100% efficient brick layers who need no communication to do their job. 0.5. Half the speed of this crunch point? That would be very disappointing. Oh no, 3.5. 3.5. Faster? All the boat. Who agrees with Pia? 3.5. Seems to know what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, who thinks it's going to be faster? Slower. Anyone tried it in practice? <laughs> okay, let's work, let's work it out. <coughs> so the first time I laid three bricks. So that's three times speed up. Perfect assumptions. Then I laid four bricks. So that's a bit more than three. So, no, three. Is it three? Right. Another three. So it's still three. Not looking good here. Next <laughs> layer. Ah, now I laid four. <laughs> So it's a bit over three. Three point yeah, three. three, three or five or yeah. And then I lay five. another another three, so this is three point two five. Two five yeah. Three point two five. <laughs> and another three. So that's three point one something. And a final three. So three just over three is this is, is the answer. So you're a bit optimistic. Yeah. But it's a good guess. So I have succeeded in uh, laying my wall in parallel and getting the speed up. Can I do any better? Place all six at once in the first row. Place all six at once. I could. I've only got four bricklets. If I had six bricklets, there's not an infinite 
row of bricklayers off to the edge of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see an extra reference? <laughs> I can't see the edge of the screen. <laughs> If you abstract so away gravity, right. you can do all of them. Sorry? Once. If you abstract away mm -hmm. gravity, you can do all of them. Ah, very, very good answer. That's right. <laughs> if I go to a perfect abstraction, I can do all of them at once. So there's some interesting things happening. <coughs> um, so your answer is actually very astute. Because what you're saying is, in an ideal world, if I have an infinite number of workers, then I can, have, I can get, if I can break my problem down uh, sufficiently, and basically, I can allocate one worker per task. And then I can get a speed up just limited only by the number of tasks that I have available. And that's a very good thing to try for. OK? Assuming no overhead. And that's the thing. A gotcha. If I'm in a finite world, on the other hand, the best I can do is to have one task per worker. So that's a limit. Also, uh, you correctly, Thomas pointed out, that this assumption that I've got to build the first row before the second one is potentially false. Now, you mentioned that gravity could play a part in this. It's true. But it would be quite possible, for example, for me to put that brick on top of this one before I lay the one to the right. So there's an artificial <coughs> dependency between the bottom row and the row above it. And this is one of the things that we have to deal with when we're writing parallel code. We have to deal not only with the essential dependencies, the brick, the second brick has to be, this brick has to be laid after that one, this one has to be laid first. But there are often artificial dependencies where people think, well, I have to do that first. But it's not really true. Okay? And finding those artificial dependencies can break new is often the secret to getting good parallel performance. Okay. Here's how not to build a wall. Lay a brick. Lay a brick, and so on. And now I have a wall. As Thomas pointed out, gravity uh, dependencies don't work in this case. Okay. This wall, for benefit of theorists, this wall is functionally equivalent to the previous wall. We can prove it. Just look at the picture. So task identification is not the only problem. You also have to consider issues like coordination, so which of the bricklayers does what when. Uh, you have to consider communication between the bricklayers. If one of them lays a brick uh, here, you don't want someone else putting a brick on top of his fingers. Okay, very important. So there can be uh, issues to do with communication that can offset our perfect uh, schedule. Uh, you need to consider placement. Which of the bricklayers chooses which brick to uh, lay, and you have to consider scheduling. Which brick should you do first? Because not all bricks are equal. If I lay this brick, I can lay one on top of it, the possible one to the right. If I lay that one, I lay this one, I now open up two possibilities. So this brick is probably better to place than that one. It creates more potential future work. So scheduling is important. And that is a black art. At the moment, scheduling essentially involves throwing tasks at a system and letting the system try to figure out what's going on without any knowledge about the workload, about the future. That seems to me to be fundamentally broken and we need to deal with that kind of problem. Okay. Typical concurrency approaches, as we see today, require the program to solve things. They might work on the small scale, they're not going to work on the mega core scale. And that's my message. We need structure, we need abstraction, we don't need a brick and wall. Don't get free public culture. <laughs> Joke. So what we need to do is we need to uh, teach people how to think in parallel. And you need new, fundamentally, you need new high-level programming constructs dealing with hundreds of millions of threads, as I showed you. Um, things, systems where you don't have to worry about deadlocks, etc., because you can waste so much time fitting around with two tasks you fail to keep track of the system as a whole. It's fundamentally a waste of time to do that. Uh, systems where you don't have to worry about the exact nature of communication. You don't want to have to say, OK, bricklayer 1, please talk to bricklayer 2, two now before you lay your brick. That is just silly from a human programming perspective. You want that sort of thing to happen through the system. And in Erlang, you're familiar with this idea through the postbox, etc. But as I was saying to you, the, the mailbox uh, concept 
is in some ways broken because it essentially relies on this shared memory assumption. We have to try to figure out how to scale that to something which is much, much bigger. Okay, so it's good, good on the single node level, but now we've got to scale it. So also, and this is something that people have forgotten about in the last 20 years, we have to deal with performance information. So we've got used to thinking that performance doesn't matter. In the modern world and in the future world, performance is, is critical. And it's not just performance in terms of how fast does your code run. It's also performance in terms of how much energy does your system use. If the system uses too much energy, it's going to be fundamentally useless. Okay? It doesn't matter how busy it is. If I can't write on, the, on my uh, tablet computer and uh, run it for more than 20 seconds, then I'm probably not going to use it. And that's going to be a real shock for people. But there is a solution. According to Bob Harper, the only thing that works in parallelism is functional programming. This is a verifiable quote. Uh, if you go to his Facebook page, you can check this. For more than the idea of verifiable. <laughs> So the parallel programming, the great thing is that you don't have an explicit ordering of expressions. You can deal with expressions from whatever order you like, which fundamentally helps with this dependency problem that I mentioned at the start of the talk. Appeal system means no side effects, so you don't have to worry about accidental interactions. You can treat each of the computations like an independent brick. You can decide exactly where to place it. So absence of side effect, very important to parallel. You can debug sequentially and run in parallel, because your program still does the same thing. And that's a huge saving in effort. If you've ever written any parallel uh, programs. Uh, no locks, deadlocks, or race conditions. If your system is properly constructed, these horrible things that take forever to, to debug simply go away. You're dealing at a higher level of abstraction where you've eliminated these problems. And I apologize to people like Costas who spent years writing really good deadlock detectors. But I think it's a lot better not to have the deadlocks in the first place than to have fantastic tools that can help them find them later. It's much more efficient and effective than my other side. Sorry, you want to go? I think we're just about to talk about it. Right. But not for very long, because I'm going to get on some other stuff. Actually, you're not. So, can you go back to the previous slide? I think here you're talking about um, deterministic parallelism, where we sequent the semantics of the parallel execution is the same as the semantics of the sequential execution. I mean, that's where you can debug sequentially. But most yes. Erlang systems do in fact, are in fact effectful. So most Erlang systems deal with, I don't know, phone calls or something. So they don't have that problem. So, um, and most Erlang people would say it is indeed functional programming. Maybe they, the, the word would be concurrent programming, but it, it is effectful. So I think you need to be a bit cautious of, of the terms here in an Erlang context. Sure, I was making a general claim rather than one specific to Erlang. So in particular, I'm talking about pure functional programming and saying you have this <laughs> potential. If you have side effects, uh, yes, you have problems. You have to deal with those side effects in a, in a good way. And we, we know from the Haskell community that there are some ways to deal with those side effects. You can encapsulate them using software transactions, for example. Uh, we can use monads, but there aren't really that many good parallel monads. Yet. These tend to be sequential. So but there, there's definitely an issue. But it's also a difference between reacting to events from an outside world where you don't have control over. Here, the revision is that you have full control of the problem, it's not going to change, you, have, you need to do some computation, and that's a different setting as well. Yeah, the, I mean, another point to make first is that um, sometimes the exact change that you're making doesn't matter. Right? So if, if you're making a series of monotonic changes to something, then actually the fact that you're making the changes doesn't really matter. So, so in some level of abstraction, the ordering then is not significant. If you can abstract at that level, then indeed you can have your parallel, you can have your parallel cake and eat it. And the problem is that in an imperative world, 
these things tend to be, you, you tend to get interactions between the things you're doing right to memory locations. This then has some unexpected effect later on. And that's the kind of thing we avoid. Erlang helps to avoid that with the independent processes and the communication. So I think with parallelism, one of the key things is to manage uh, any shared state between your threads or processes. And monotonicity is one way of, of dealing with that shared state. So if you have some nice property about the shared state that it, it's, it's monotonically increasing, then, mm -hmm. then that's a nice property. Um, I think what you're talking about here is where you have no shared state, and that is indeed a beautiful world to work in. I, th mm -hmm. I, I think uh, Erlang is, is, uh, deals with state by encapsulating it within the process. So you, uh, there's a shared nothing model. The, the state is entirely local to the process and is only ever shared by communication, which is explicit. And you can see. So I think the, the argument is you, you have to manage the state between the threads and processes yep. crucially. And um, <coughs> no shared state, you're in a beautiful world. But there are many worlds in which state is important and for a reactive model, uh, uh, distributed actor model like Erlang, um, uh, the, the actor model is a nice way of, of managing uh, state. Yeah, I, th I, think I, I think I agree. Um, the, <coughs> the point really is that there is this potential for large scale parallels and we need to find the right abstractions that allow us to scale up to reach it. And if we do have state manipulation, then we have to find the right encapsulation, the right abstractions that allow us uh, to uh, have these state interactions where we need them, but not to have unwanted, um, unwanted, unnecessary dependencies. Because these dependencies, as I try to show you, are things that are going to kill you in the parallel system in the long term. So there is a very interesting question to do with the interaction between concurrency and parallelism. And that's one of the things, one of the challenges that we have to face as a research community, not just in our life, in the broader community. Great. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. So I will tell you a bit about the project we're running. I'm conscious that I have about 10 minutes, and I've got about two hours worth of slides. <coughs> so I'm currently running uh, a 3.2 million euro uh, European project, it's a three year project, it involves Erlang Solutions, uh, it involves uh, Elta from Hungary and various other uh, partners. And what we're trying to do is to work on an idea of pattern based <coughs> programming. This helps, I think, answer your question a bit, Phil. So the idea is to try to find the right uh, structures, the right uh, patterns of parallelism in, in your code that then allow us to deal with mass level uh, parallels but also to expose, hopefully, uh, essential dependencies. We haven't yet done that, but we think it is a mechanism that will let us do that. So the idea is that you start off with sequential code up here, and this can be Erlang, it can be C or C++, it could be Java, it could be Pascal, and search your favorite functional programming language or other language here. We have a generic pattern library and a machine that cranks through our source and gives us out a uh, patterned parallel code, Erlang, C++, etc. These are parallel versions. Now I'm afraid if you give me C++, I won't get Haskell out. Much as I would like. If you give me Haskell, I might get C out, but the same as it has C back end. So we're doing, these are source-to-source -source transformations that we're doing here, uh, using generic patterns, targeting particular um, heterogeneous hardware patterns and using costing profiling information in an essential way. This thing here, my sausage machine, my sausage factory, I crank the handle, I get the code coming in, crank the handle, out pops the parallel code. Uh, this is refactoring, software refactoring. And what we're doing is we're using a library of patterns. So common patterns uh, we're familiar with include things like maps, reduces, the parallel community also farms where we're distributing work to different workers and collating the results, not necessarily in the same order that we set them up. Okay, so this is what we <coughs> in terms of non-deterministic 
uh, parallels and felt the order results could vary here. Uh, also, parallel pipelines, you have a pipeline that you can familiar with this aspect. Uh, you take one value here, you pass it on to the next guy in the chain, they can work in parallel, and so on, to an arbitrary extent. And a very powerful pattern, uh, divide and conquer, essentially combines a kind of uh, farm, some sort of farm, decomposition, and then a reduced phase where you're collecting combining the results at the end. So these are common patterns of, that we see in parallel computing, and the common patterns that we see in functional programming. Generally, you're going to need to combine these in some arbitrary way. We've implemented a library that implements some of these patterns in Erlang. Uh, the Skull library, basically providing pluggable templates. Uh, and these are fully nestable. So you can have a map within a reduce, reduce within a map, a farm with a map with reduce, etc., etc. Here is the URL for it, and you can get downloaded from GitHub. From GitHub. Essentially, the way this works is you uh, get a list of output items. What we do is you pass in some abstraction of the skeleton structure, the pattern structure, uh, as a parameter to a particular Erlang procedure. Give it the input. The system sets up the task for us, runs these things in parallel, gives us the results. <coughs> so we're layering on the usual Erlang uh, concurrency model to give us a parallel So, for example, with a parallel pipeline, we may be composing several skeletons. Uh, what we do is we say this is a pipeline, this is an Erlang token, an Erlang atom, that we're just using to label the pipeline, pass some abstractions to each of the nested skeletons, give the inputs, and this will create a pipeline linking all of those stages together in some structured way. Or with farm, where we're running the same thing in parallel a number of times, what we say is we want to farm a particular skeleton, so that could be a pipeline, could be another farm, could be a map, could be whatever. M times, so we've got M instances of it, give it the inputs, and uh, the result of this is a list of output items, which is basically that thing run in parallel, so it's still run in parallel. We have a number of rules that let us uh, do things like introducing and eliminating farms. So this is actually reversible. We can take any skeleton and we can farm it. We can take a farm of any skeleton and we can collapse it. So you can add parallelism and remove it in a reversible way. As a very simple refactoring rule. <coughs> yes. so I'm, I'm going to show you this because I think I've got just enough time to do it. So here's a little example. Uh, this is an image processing example. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read an image uh, with a black background and another image also with a black background. So this is a Viking helmet and Joe Armstrong. What I'm going to do is find white screening to remove the image off the first background. So it's like green screening, but we couldn't be bothered to turn it to green. And then we're going to merge the images. And the result of this is a proof that Joe is really a Viking, as you can see on the right here. The basic Erlang structure of this is that what we've got is a system where we're reading images, we're doing convert, merge, and writing the result. So here, what we, the key part is that the convert image uh, does a white screen, notice the images, and produces the result. I won't go into the details <coughs> of any of this very simple algorithm. And the sequential structure then, for each image, what we do is we read the image, convert it, write it back out. So one parallel structure would be to farm over the reads, to use and use a pipeline to connect those through conversions to farm over the rights, for example. So these things are side effect in the Or alternatively, what we might do is to farm over a composition of something which does a read, a convert, and then a write. So these are functionally equivalent. Uh, they have different parallel structures. Now, I'm going to try to do this in a couple of minutes. What I'm going to do is show you how the refactoring <coughs> works. I'll find the play 
Any questions? to is if I can't press, um, can you see this roughly? Yeah, see so roughly up to What we're doing here is we are selecting the code that we want to refactor. This is basically what I showed you with the read, convert, and the write. Up here, we have a little uh, Wrangler window. This is everyone's favorite IDE. This is Emacs. But we do have other versions too. 